All right, the National Summer Learning Association. This is going to be on the final exam. I'm telling you now, but it's a shorty, it's multiple choice. So um, I'm Jay Fidel, this is Think Tech, and we're talking about community matters, more specifically education on a national level. Uh, Carl Ackerman, uh, uh, formerly of Punahou, and uh, an expert in Eastern European history, which, which we're not gonna discuss today, if it's okay with you, Carl. Uh, and Aaron Warkin, the National Summer Learning Association. He's the CEO. But for a proper introduction, I'm asking Carl to introduce him. Carl? Yeah, um, Aaron Vorkin is, is someone that really has a handle on what's going on in terms of summer learning, that broad topic, whether that's a camp, that it's a school, uh, that's an association, that's the arts, etc all across the United States. And he just came back from a huge conference in Washington, D.C., staying at that wonderful hotel called the Mayflower that's so historic. Everyone should look it up, the Mayflower Hotel. And, you know, being a guy who is low-key, I'm, I'm, of course, joking here, uh, you know, he had two secretaries from uh, President Biden's cabinet, that is, Secretary of Labor and Secret Secretary of Education. But really, the true... Um, a key speaker at this event was Thomas Friedman, who really gave an eloquent speech about summer learning. So it, it, there's one person in the United States who knows a lot about summer learning, and that's um, Aaron Dvorkin. And, and it's no accident that when the Secretary of Education and the White House wants to know something about summer learning, and especially um, uh, Jill Biden, uh, she turns to Aaron. And so he, it's a really special treat to have him here in Hawaii um, on uh, Think Tech Hawaii, run by that everlasting mensch, Jay Fidel. <laughs> well, with that, welcome, Aaron. Aaron <laughs> Thank <Dworkin>. you. <laughs> you want to do a rebuttal on that? You know, you can if you wish. <laughs> no, but I'm going to send it to my mother. So thank you, Carl. <laughs> that was very kind of you. I could say equally nice things about you, and I could tell Jay as well. I'll, I'll say nice <laughs> things about Jay when this is over. When it's over. Thank you. So Aaron, what is summer learning? Um, we really need to know because all of learning is of value. In fact, one of our motto points here at ThinkTech is always learning. Sure. Well, I mean, that's really what it is. So summer learning is a metaphor for three things. We talk about summer learning, but it's, the, it's three different things that we're talking about really. One, it's about promoting educational equity, which means Summertime is the most unfair time in education in America. We, by law, educate all kids. <clears throat> Some of them drop out, but it's a requirement to go to school. And we educate them typically, let's say, September to June. And then in the summer months, we stop. And middle and upper middle class families who have resources and have access to great programs, their families, without blinking or thinking, happily pay lots of money for them to have great experiences that can keep learning and growing and thriving in different ways. Uh, that benefit them and they do well coming back to school. And then for millions of kids, especially the most vulnerable low income kids, they do not have those opportunities. And the research of my organization going back 30 years, National Summer Learning Association was to show that these gaps grow most dramatically between higher income kids and lower income kids in the summer. So first of all, it's, it's, it's how do we close these academic uh, equity issues? The second thing that summer learning represents is about opportunity. And so, so you can learn in lots of different settings and in lots of different ways over the summer. So you could be in school, you could be at a camp, you could have a summer job, you can have a summer internship. That's a form of summer learning, right? You're growing, you're learning about a career. You can learn tech skills. You could be a, an apprentice to someone. You could do lots, you could travel, you could do lots of things. Again, so how do we create more opportunities for more kids so they could see what's out there for themselves? College, you know how many colleges are running programs for high school kids? Uh, to learn about you know, the SATs and how to apply and all these different experiences. Again, if you have resources, you could go. If you don't, uh, you miss out. So it's about equity. It's about opportunity. The last thing about summer learning that makes it really special and effective is it, it creates these smaller environments that build community. And so I represent an organization that serves more than 15,000 entities from school districts to nonprofits, Boys and Girls Club, YMCA, the largest national groups to the smallest grassroots groups. And then youth serving government agencies, libraries, parks and rec centers, public housing authorities, summer jobs programs. 
All these groups are trying to fill in the gap the best way they can to serve kids over the summer months uh, because they know it's important. And the thing that makes all good programs stand out and have the results that everyone's impressed by is that they build a sense of community in their program where the staff and the adults care and know the kids and the kids feel ownership for the what they're doing there and they want to come and it, it builds a sense of community no matter what activity they're doing. So that's what it is. Summer learning is about equity, opportunity, and community. It has had a huge moment right now in the last three years. My phone has not stopped ringing since COVID started. Because if Jay, if you let me, I'll just explain this context piece, which is if you go back to March, 2020, if you can remember that far back when COVID shut down the world, most conventional wisdom said, oh, kids will have to be out of school at the most for three months. So everyone who cared and worked in education said, who has research on what happens to kids when they're out of school for three months? That was my organization, because that's what we track, what happens over the summer. Then the second piece of conventional wisdom was, well, now every kid in America is gonna to have to go to some form of summer school. And who has the expertise about how to set up a good summer program? That was also my organization. <laughs> so no matter what, now both of these things proved wrong, but I will just share that, what did prove correct and sadly is, and you, last week, the, they called the NAEP, the National Standardized Test about kids reading and math scores came out and you, you saw the headline and all our fears have been confirmed. The COVID and, and Zoom learning was not good for the majority of students in America. And we have gotten the lowest scores uh, that we've had in, in decades. We knew that probably was gonna happen, uh, if, especially if you were low income and you didn't have access to technology and parents who could help you and all these other things uh, to navigate. So, so here we are, and there is up to $30 billion in the federal American rescue plan uh, to be spent across the country by school districts and state education departments on how to help kids catch up, especially leveraging the summer months. So that's the moment we're in, and that's kind of what summer learning has become a national priority. Mm, yeah, a couple a couple of questions and thoughts about that. Uh, what's the difference between summer learning, you know, in a school setting, uh, the same school that you went to the rest of the year, and summer camp? Uh, because what you know, when you start talking about community, the kind that yep. lasts, the kinds that mm -hmm. builds lasting relationships, I think of summer camp, which was in itself, um, you know, a tremendous education. Uh, mm -hmm. What's the difference between summer camp? You know, and, I, and I have a feeling Carl is going to comment. On sure, this. if I may, and then Carl can jump in. I, I will say two things on this. One, uh, sometimes my joke is if summer school and the academic goals of summer school, teaching kids math, reading, science, STEM, they call that, uh, had a baby with summer camp and all the arts and the enrichment and being in nature and running around and having leadership skills and community skills and team building skills, if they combined, you'd end up with summer learning. We don't want you to only have one or the other. And, that, and, and the moment we're in requires a combination. And so it's getting people to reimagine. And, and this is important, Jay, for people who don't know who might be listening. Summer school traditionally in America has been a punishment. It has, it's been remedial. You just learn what you already learned and didn't figure out. Uh, it's been in a school setting, just like you were in. It's had no uh, athletics, it had no enrichment, it had no you know, health and fitness, it had nothing else. And kids didn't have a say in what they got to learn. Just a kind of a punitive required uh, experience. Versus, and so people historically have not wanted to go to summer school, if, if we're just honest about it. Teachers don't want to teach in it, kids don't want to go in it, and people could be forced to go and participate. Summer learning was a reimagination of what that could be, and, and it could be the exact opposite. So it's not a punishment. Actually, you make it so fun that people want to go because you can learn so many new things, and you don't need to make a requirement. You can make it voluntary, and people want to come. And you don't just learn the things that the school required. You now have a chance to learn new things. You want to learn how to be a podcast producer. You want to learn how to write a TV script. You can do that in the summer. You can, you know, you can kind of reimagine. And so it doesn't have to only be a punishment for kids who failed. It could be also an option for kids who want to accelerate their learning and gain further credits or gain new career skills and all these other trips and experiences. And it doesn't only have to take place inside the four walls of a school building. 
It could be at your museum. It could be at your aquarium. It could be at your college campus. It could be at a private school that you don't get to go to during the year, but now they're opening up their gates and letting you learn there. So that's what we're seeing. It's a huge variety. It, it depends a lot on partnerships. Uh, that's how I would say it's really this merging of the best of summer camp with the best of academic learning. But Carl t led a great program uh, for many years, if he wants to weigh in on, on what oh, I do. I do. Carl, uh, you know, talk about your program and uh, and summer learning uh, through your program and at Punahou, and talk about your participation in the conference in Washington. Well, let me let me begin and, and just echo some of the themes that um, and thank you, Jay, um, that Aaron just talked about. Um, the Pueo program took kids, um, all of whom were on free or reduced lunch and in the great middle academically and gave them a summer program that was number one, fun. When they first came in, uh, they came in at fifth grade and they had robotics classes. And they also had one of the best classes I think that's been taught forever, anywhere, a magic class. And the kids were hooked. And, and you know, what they did is they stayed in the program for seven years. And in the older years, they had um, four credit, and that's really important, four credit DOE classes. We had a partnership with our statewide DOE uh, between Punahou School and the statewide DOE. And the kids took Hawaiian history, they took English, they took a variety of, uh, you know, um, SAT prep, and, you know, they got credit for it. So by the time the kids left, when they were, uh, when they were senior, they, had, they, they, they actually had um, uh, six credits that they could apply toward their high school graduation. So that was the key, really. And, and you know, not remedial stuff, which is, you know, tr uh, what Aaron was talking about, um, but it was more, um, it, we were more interested in kids getting credits and actually even getting dual credits, which the current superintendent, Keith Hayashi, has pioneered at Waipahu High School. And so our kids were getting not only credits for high school, but also getting credits for UH. So it put them up on the ladder. And that's, that's really the key. And just to conclude about the conference, what impresses you about the National Summer Learning Association Conference is, I think, for me, two things. One, there are so many people there that are doing innovative things like Pueo. I mean, I was one among many. And, you know, from, from Jewish camps to people who were working, um, you know, in after, after school areas. And, you know, it's really interesting the way people are approaching a variety of things. And also, um, as Aaron mentioned, you know, pulling data away from this and achieving great things and saying, hey, this works, for example. The second thing that's really important that I saw is a bunch of young people. I mean, people the age of my daughter, you know, I mean, they're in their 30s. And the, you know, there were many people who came from the wide spectrum of America. And, you know, there are, there are uh, people of color, um, many women. And, you know, it, it's, it's interesting when you have a community in Washington, D.C., where the conference was, that looked, Jay, in many ways like Hawaii, where if you're, you know, if you're Caucasian, or as we say in Hawaii, Haole, you're a minority. And, and you know, in other words, I think pulling all these different groups of people together that have very different experiences in their lives, you know, um, and uh, people from various different socioeconomic uh, frameworks, and a lot of people began by talking about th their particular childhood, which is, and many of them had childhoods where they were challenged economically. It was just wonderful. And it was, you know, I always came away from the National Summer Learning Conference, Association Conference, you know, upbeat. Um, and this one was particularly good. And of course, it was at the Mayflower Hotel where there's all this history of presidents, et cetera. And you felt like you walked into a history camp and then you know, there were sessions there. So, that, you know, it was just wonderful. Well, let's talk about diversity. The diversity certainly at the conference. But what about diversity in the program itself? Uh, am I going to meet new people? You know, when I went to summer camp, we met everyone. We met new people. We, you know, learned about other groups and what they were after. Um, is that happening? Does that happen in the National Summer Learning Association? So, so just to be clear, so yes, our members do it. So we're the umbrella group. We are a coalition of more than 15,000 organizations serving millions of, of especially low-income kids. It's a very, very diverse uh, array of people that are being served. But by the way, uh, a lot of, when you talk about low-income in America, a lot of uh, low-income rural white kids, you know, there's like, it's not by ethnicity here, you know, low-income low kids are, 
are, are everywhere. Uh, a lot of times, by the way, they would not even tell you that they know that they're low income. Uh, it's not until someone they become much older that a lot of people will self-report. Oh, I didn't know I was considered uh, poor or something like this until I got to college and they told me I was that. So, you know, when you live where you live, it's not a big deal. But it, the way we talk about poverty in this country is based on, do you need a free meal? And that's the, if you qualify for the free and reduced lunch program. That's And so when we talk about poverty for kids in kindergarten through 12th grade, we're talking about the 29 million children in America who qualify uh, for, for free meals. So with that said, yes, you know, the country, but it's a broad spectrum. We have people from Alabama. They, they, they look different than they look in Hawaii, you know, so all of that. But what cuts across here is it comes down to relationships. That's what, you know, is the special sauce of all these programs. I, there was a guy from Detroit uh, who runs an award-winning program. So just like Carl, we give out national awards and his program, Carl's program won. And we also had another winner one year um, from Detroit called Math Corps, where it's run by the math professor from Wayne State University in Detroit. And he gets six, he gets high school kids, he pays high school kids to teach math, the middle school kids, and he pays the college kids to teach the high school kids. And then he doesn't have a staffing shortage. He's everyone just graduates into the, the next role. Oh, that's wonderful. wonderful. And, he, and he had a student at our conference named Zion, who I worked with this past summer, who is now a senior at Dartmouth on a full scholarship, who got so high up in math that he got tired and bored of math. And he became a physics major just because it was more interesting. Yeah, that's what happens. And right. And so he <laughs> he spoke and he this past summer. Uh, my organization sponsored a all expense paid congressional summer internship. It would be great to get an alum of Carl's program to come and work for Senator Schatz or, or in D.C. Um, Schatz, I'm not sure how, how do you pronounce it. Um, but anyway, Zion came and he worked for the uh, senator from Michigan, Gary Peters. And this is just funny because you can't make it up. This is about opportunity. So even if he had gotten the internship, there's no way he could have afforded to come to Washington, D.C. Fly. We pay for his clothes, business coat. We pay for his flight. We pay for his apartment, pay for his food, got him the internship, everything. And he did a great job. It just happened, and this had nothing with us, uh, that the senator from Michigan that he worked for is on the oversight committee of NASA. And... This guy, Zion, who's a senior, a physics major, is infatuated with space and loves NASA and loves everything to do with outer space. And he was the only intern out of 30 interns in the whole office of the senator who cared about NASA. And he got to spend so much time with the senator, going to every hearing and writing briefings and having conversations with the senator in a way that no one else could get. And he's going to have a lot of options right now. This kid's I'm sure, and, this yeah. is, and this is kind of like what we're talking about with opportunity and you know and and, and the reason you talk about being diverse and this comes back to your question about yeah, about diversity the uh the if you look at the staff of who works for our members of congress in washington dc sadly in order to get hired full-time you need to have interned in the summer most often about 80 percent of them were interns for free subsidized. They think they did it for nothing, but the truth is someone behind them paid for them to live and, and make that possible. So it is not reflective of America, the staff who are writing laws and working for their congressmen and senators. It does not represent the diversity and beauty of America. And so that's just one little place where you can see the high, R, high ROI, the return on investment, if you kind of make a laser sharp focus into summer opportunities for kids. because Boom, after eight weeks, you get a job offer. Now he's a staffer. Now he's working on NASA policy. Boom, just like that. You mentioned, you know, uh, I, I want to get a track with you, Aaron, on, on COVID and the need, the uh, usefulness of, of Zoom and virtual connection. Uh, mm -hmm. and not only in the National uh, Summer Learning Association and its members then, because uh, we're, you know, mostly... We're out of it mostly, but not really. Um, but what about you know going forward? Um, I suggest to you that COVID has changed our world. Uh, COVID has brought virtual connection, you know, communication and learning into our world on a long-term basis. Um, and and uh, you know you talk about the money uh, from the Biden administration. 
on helping to bridge the digital gap, the, mm -hmm. uh, the computer equipment and broadband gap. Mm -hmm. um, so is this happening uh, you know, within the association, within summer learning um, to, to find computer equipment, um, to make virtual learning a long-term, um, even a permanent change in American education? Like, I, I mean, I think lots of people have different opinions. I, I'd say the majority consensus is that Zoom learning did not work for the majority of kids. There were some kids, they could go at their own pace. They had their own laptop already uh, that it worked for. And of course it is part now, we all, Zoom is part of our lexicon. Like we know this is how we're talking today for sure. And look at, look at the workforce return uh, questions about who, who gets to come back to work or who doesn't and what's gonna happen, that's for sure. But listen, there's a reason we, we teach and run school in person. And it is a more effective way to kind of meet kids where they are. As you get older, you, you know who it does not work for is little kids. Okay, kindergartners, first graders, impossible. You try to teach a class of, you know, 30 second graders on Zoom, impossible, does not work. So throw that out. As you get older, middle school, high school kids, you know, yeah, they're a little more self-conscious. They don't want to show up. They don't want to see each other. They want to put the camera on, the camera off, all these different things. I think it was very difficult for teachers. Teachers, you we're saying the, 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 the crux of teaching is building some kind of personal connection with your students. And, and Zoom is a one-dimensional. It's not three-dimensional. So how are you going to really do that? Well, I you know, but let, me, let me offer this yeah. thought. You know, there's, there's, you have a lot, of, a lot of kids, a lot of people. Um, mm -hmm. who have, have no way to do it except for virtual. Um, and if they did not have virtual, they would not do it. So for example, I get to meet you today. And, and uh, I, I, I feel I'm, I'm getting to know you. Everybody watching this is getting to know you. Uh, and so we're way ahead because of that. And I'm getting to know uh, Carl better. And we're way ahead because of that. Now, if I didn't have Zoom, if I didn't have virtual, Aaron, I would never have met you. Uh, there, I would, there, look, I, there's certainly there's certainly benefits. There's certainly benefits. I agree. You're, you're saving on travel costs. We're we're, we're talking cross time zones. I'm not I'm not gonna say it, there aren't utilities around this for sure. I, I'm just saying that from a if you're really trying to teach, you know, there's some examples. Khan Academy. You know, you could record it. You could go back. You could ask questions. There's a lot about what they call the flipped classroom. And, and how now, instead of me coming to school to learn the lesson, you learn the lesson at home and you come to school and you come with your questions. And we're just gonna talk about what the problems were. Now, I'm not gonna have to teach you. You can watch my recording before. There is a level of self-discipline that that requires. There's also a level, and this is to your point, you know, when they asked the question, when Zoom, when, when COVID first happened, this is an equity issue. They said, the question was to the kids, do you have a computer at home? And maybe the answer is yes, but it was the wrong question. The better question was, do you have, and does every kid in your family have access to a computer to do their schoolwork? Because there might've been one computer in the house, but the mom needed it for her job. So the kid doesn't have a computer. And if there's four kids in the family, you're, you're, you're screwed up. So there, and you know, that's when you heard the stories of the kids being dropped off at the Wendy's in order to be on the uh, Wi-Fi. You know, th there's a lot of little things like that that people don't, think about. I mean, I think all the tech companies have been trying to get that, but now again, so now you have it. Like, uh, like social media is a whole other discussion you could talk about. You know, how many Zoom calls have you been on where everybody's on the Zoom call is sending emails to someone else while they're on it? And no it one's happens. It happens. Yeah. Right? Everyone's doing it. So, and, and, and then you get into this. I, I think there's something also, Jay, that we should lift up, which is there's the academic challenges that kids have had. There's also the isolation that kids went through that have led to dramatic social, emotional, mental health challenges for kids. Suicide attempts among teenage girls went up 51% between 2019 and 2021. Wow. Okay, people are, were isolated. You want, I know we're saying Zoom is so great, but it, on a certain level, it gets us some things functionally done. But on the other hand, if you, you know, kids were not allowed to eat lunch together, they weren't allowed to be on sports teams together, they weren't allowed to be on the playground together. All the things that allow you to build relationship and a, you know, a sense of community were taken away from kids for two years, two plus years. 
and now they're isolated. They don't know how to talk to one another. They get into fights. Fights are breaking out like crazy. They're, you know, you know, vandalizing bathrooms all over the place. I mean, the reports of what's been going on are serious, serious. And nobody knows how to de-escalate anymore. You know, the, the first summer, it's gotten better this 2022 summer. But in 2021, when kids had not been together for a long time, every summer camp director reported almost that I, anecdotally that it was the hardest summer they ever ran in their lives. People who've been running camps for 50 years. And they said, why? Because even the staff were out of practice. Pe people lost patience with each other. They had no practice around patience. If you had a problem that normally a counselor can come and, or a teacher can kind of de-escalate it, it escalated in 10 seconds. And then the parents were crazy too. And everybody's jumping on each other. That happens in Congress too. That's, <laughs> yeah, another, yeah. that's another discussion. So, the, one, of the thing I want, one of the things I wanted to get to, uh, Aaron, is, is, uh, is you know, <clears throat> kids are also attracted by negative influences, as, as Congress is, for that matter. Um, and, you know, like there's drugs, there's standing on the street corner. Um, there's dealing with, you know, kids who are not good role models. Um, there's all these negative things that, um, you know, that are not educational, that are bad education. And so, you you know, you, the, the association, the 15,000 members, mm -hmm. member organizations, the association have to have a way of attracting kids um, to do summer learning uh, and, and get them off the street, so to speak. How, how do you do that? How do you appeal to them? Look, a lot of we have a lot of great examples, and so I, I don't want I don't want to. First of all, there's a lot written that even gangs. When you talk about gangs, why do people join gangs? To have a sense of community, to have a sense of family. You know, you, you if you don't, you're looking for five people to look out for you, and you want to be loyal to them, you'll be loyal to you. I'm not saying it's a great way to go about living, making choices, but you you can see if you had nothing. Where would you turn? And, and so you have to give kids other options. And I think, especially as Carl was working with middle school students, you know, your, your identity is up for grabs. And you're trying to learn who you are. And you're saying, do I want to go down that street and go be with those kids? Or do I want to go into a summer program that every summer is going to teach me about colleges and jobs? And I'm going to meet mentors and take field trips. And I'm going to learn all these new options that I had no idea existed. Things that you can't get to during the school year because there's so much required curriculum that everyone's got to teach. That it's really only in the summer. So I I think there's a lot about opening up people's minds. And I think when you're a kid, and I like to always talk about this because I ran uh, after school and summer programs for uh, an organization that served 90,000 kids in 20 cities. And and we always talked about how Jay, you and Carl and me, you can we can look back on our lives and everything, how you got to here and how the Coast Guard sent you back to NYU and back to Hawaii. And now next thing you know, you have your own TV show. You know, it all makes sense how you got here. But if you're a 12 year old looking forward, it is completely unclear how you might end up in, in Carl Ackerman's shoes or Jay Fidel's shoes. And so the onus is on the adults in these programs to kind of light up these pathways and light up these options. It's not about giving an opportunity, it's about options. And it's not about just giving a kid a chance, it's about giving kids choices. So they know what they're, you know, and so every day, every adult in America asks millions of kids, what do you wanna be when you grow up? And the correct response for a kid should be, what are my choices? <laughs> don't ask me what I wanna be when I grow up, I'm nine, I don't know. You need to show me a few different options here. And so there's some onus on, on the adults. And then what really is the key, Jay, for every successful program, when I, I was talking about community and equity and all this stuff, is about kids, you know, education, in my opinion, and Carl will be interested in your opinion, is about how fast we can get kids to take ownership for their own learning. Period. End of story. If, if you want to fail kids and force them and give them detention and require them to do this and require, you know, you can drag people to graduate across the finish line, kicking and screaming. But at what point are they on their own with no push from their teacher or their parent or coach going to say, I want to read a book because I want to read it. And sometimes when I would do staff trainings, I would ask adult, uh, staff, I'd say, what was the first grown up book you ever read on your own 
because you wanted to. No one forced you to. Because that is the, that's a moment of taking ownership for your own learning. I don't know, Jay or Carl, do you remember how old you were and what the name of the book was? That was a grown-up book that you read? <laughs> There's so many that come to mind. I can't, I can't pick one. Uh, Carl, Carl, uh, you know, I got to tell you something, Aaron. You know, Carl is, Carl is here. He's with us. He organized our, our meeting today. I have had dozens of hours of, of um, mutual exchange of new, nutritious discussion with Carl, but I have actually never met him. I have You've never, never met Carl? I've never met you, Carl. Do you live I'm on the same Carl. island? I've never met Carl. Are you have both I, have I met you, Carl? I've met you, Carl. You know what, Jay? I've never thought about that because we've had so many Zoom meetings and because we've had so many <laughs> telephone conversations. That's absolutely true. And I could say... Um, I could say that love does appear on through uh, through Zoom. Because I love this man, and, and he's wonderful. But to get, to get back to the, I don't want to get too modular. Well, I, I, I want to refine the point. He's way right? taller than you think, Jay. He's way taller than you think. <laughs> yeah, anyway, but, but I want, I I want to refine refine the point you made, uh, Aaron, and that is options. Okay, options for education. Options to pick a book, you know, and to make it part of your. You know your 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 identity somehow. Okay, <clears throat> let me let me add that that exact um, process exists with respect to life itself. Uh, you know, you get up in the morning, you look out the window, and you say to yourself, "What are my options today?" That's a better life. So if you teach the kid how to examine options, how to make choices, how to find things that help him create the identity you're you're teaching him things about life in general too yeah jay if i can give you an example there's a great guy named steve mariotti who was a math teacher in the bronx new york for a long time and was having trouble getting the kids to pay attention to him and he started putting dollar signs next to all the math problems he was working on and everyone sat up and started paying attention he's all of a sudden the same math problem now they're th thinking about talking about how to make money and from that, he created something called NIFTY, the National Foundation for Teaching Entrepreneurship, which is running in thousands of schools and teaching kids how to write business plans and teaching high level math, but through real world application. You know, when people, people want to learn multiplication division. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but, you know, hey, this is about how I'm going to make money. And they had to write business plans. And all of a sudden, they started treating each other nicer because they were all viewing each other as customers. And they all had to sell things to one another in the classroom. So I'm just like, there's there's hooks into everything. I got into this work. I was started a basketball mentoring program in New York City. I was a volunteer in the Big Brothers Big Sisters with a huge waiting list of teenage boys, and and the social worker needed to find more men. And I I was playing basketball twice a week after work with hundreds of men in these gyms and leagues around New York City. And I say it did not take a rocket scientist to say. Could I get these men to stop what they're doing to hang out with kids? They didn't want to do it, but they wanted to play basketball. So I said, would you play basketball with a eighth grade boy? And then talking about college and jobs and leadership. And they did that. And it's about finding the hook is the point. And we yeah. I actually want to. But the hook, know, is as, different for, the hook is different for every kid. The okay. hook is different for every kid. That's why we have a variety of programs. That's why we don't have one single boys and girls club that everyone in America has to go to. You might be interested in sports. Someone's interested in music. Someone's interested in business. Someone's interested in cooking. You can get to reading and math and literacy through all these different angles. And this is why Carl was saying there were so many entrepreneurs and innovators that he kept meeting at my conference because everyone is coming at it for the kids in their community and neighborhood through a different way. And you also want to take advantage of the assets and resources of your community. So we heard from a guy, Carl and I, last week from the U.S. Virgin Islands, a professor at the, I guess, St. Thomas University. And he said, people from all over the world come to study oceanography in the U.S. Virgin Islands. But 70% of the kids who grow up in the Virgin Islands do not know how to swim. And they don't get to take part in any of this huge industry that's happening there. People come from all over to study marine biology. So he had to create, he wanted to create a summer program to teach kids oceanography, marine biology. First, he had to teach them how to swim. Then he teaches them how to scuba dive. Then he's teaching them science. Now there are jobs for them. And that's something that's in his backyard. 
that he could take advantage of. And that's why we have local control in education because people know, you know what's working where they are. 4-H, this is an amazing organization. I'll just share if you ever heard of them, the largest youth out of school time organization. They were created by a charter of Congress with the US Department of Agriculture, America. This is one of the more interesting stories, Carl, if you know the history of 4-H. They are a youth after school program with summer camp that was started by the Department of Agriculture in the 1800s because our country, our entire economy back then was based on agriculture and everyone who ran a farm inherited from their parents and their grandparents. And so no one was learning a new strategy or technology about how to increase production or use new tools. So the US Department of Agriculture had this idea. This is before computers, before telephones, before iPhone. How they did this, it's actually amazing. And they created the blue ribbon, the county fair, they create these 4-H clubs everywhere where they got the kids in the programs to teach them all the new tricks so they would come back to their dad and mom and say, hey, you gotta help me grow a bigger tomato or a bigger sheep. And we gotta learn all this and dad help me do it because I wanna win, I wanna win. And then those kids grew up to inherit the farms. And that's how we re-educated and updated the skills of our entire agriculture the workforce that is a wonderful, <laughs> a wonderful after school story. story if yeah, only I mean, we could do that today uh, <laughs> carl, right. carl we have to hear from you about yes. about punaho and how you offer options to kids and how you get them motivated well, let me, to make let choices me, let me begin with what aaron just said because i think he'll be interested in 4-h is a big thing in hawaii and if you go to maui there's a school called lahaina luna in Lahaina Luna goes through junior high school and high school, and it's a working farm. And the kids came from all islands originally. And, the, you know, I think the school was established in the mid 19th century. So, uh, you know, under the uh, kingdom. And um, what's interesting about this school is that it was a working farm and the farm originally used to provide sus sustenance for the kids. <laughs> it was a working farm. So the kids um, survived. And I think today it's still a working farm, Lahaina Luna and 4-H has always been big in Hawaii because of our agricultural roots. So there are people, um, and I think, I, I think my wife has even said that she was a member of a 4-H club uh, here on Oahu through Roosevelt High School, but I, I, have to, I have to confirm that. But going back to what Aaron was saying about culture, and I have to tell you two things very briefly. The first is, in the Pueo program, I began a chant, and the chant went like this. What group are you in? And the kids would yell out Pueo which is our Hawaiian now, but it stands for Partnerships and Unlimited Educational Opportunities as an acronym. And I'd say again, what group are you in? And they'd say Pueo. And I'd say, where are you going? And the kids would answer college. That was the chant. And I'd say, where are you going? And they would say college. Because I think it's important in all these groups, because you were just talking about finance, Aaron, to develop a culture, a culture, an educational culture, that I bet if we asked the three of us, why did you go to college? Well, I don't think there was any choice. Our parents expected it, and it was, you know, it was sort of like a middle class thing to do. And I don't want to, and maybe you guys came from upper middle class or whatever. I don't want to go there, but you know, it was it was expected, and there's there is a culture. But I want to go back, Jay, to the National Summer Learning Association. You know, before uh, we went on the air, Aaron asked me, "Who did you meet?" I remet this woman who used to work for uh, um, NSLA named Brenda McLaughlin, and I want to tell you that not only is NSLA a uh, coalition of people, but this woman would come out and offer advice, which she did in Pueo. But at one point, I know, um, Aaron, this is for you, uh, Jay knows this, that, that Punahou and the Rizho is, is, let's just say, a well-off school. I'll, I'll end there. Um, and, you know, she could pull in, you know, the high mucky mucks in, Hawaii and get them on the board. But um, what Brenda McLaughlin did from your organization is the Punahou board had a man named Case, you know, America Online, and he had an organization called Revolution in uh, Washington, D.C. And Brenda, before the program came to its completion of seven years, so the kids would graduate and go to college and we could have numbers, she came in and organized a study for us that could prove to donors that it was good. So we met with the Punahou board at Revolution. Um, uh, Mr. Case's headquarters in Washington, D.C., and they asked questions about Pueo. I didn't say a bloody thing. Brenda did all the talking, and the <laughs> program was sold. It got financed. 
And that's because of the power of the National Summer Learning Association. And it was also through, you know, your, your, your longtime member and founder of NSLA, Matthew Belay. And I want to point out to you, Jay, because you're a military guy, that the founder of this organization is a former Marine. So, you know, I, I get, you know, sometimes tired that people who are associated with, you know, uh, 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 good things and that might be considered liberal are always, you know, oh, but did they serve in the military and things like that? And I came from a military family, for example. But, you know, Matthew, who discovered this organization, is a, is a bloody Marine Corps member and very proud of it. So, you know, the National Summer Learning Association is just a marvelous organization. And uh, Aaron is such a, you know, young mensch uh, to be part of it. Every time I see him, I think he looks younger because I kept getting older. Anyway, I'll stop there. It must, it must agree with him. It must agree yeah. with you, Aaron. And we're about out of time, and I want to offer you guys a, a moment to leave a message, whatever the message may be, uh, with whoever is watching. Um, and uh, uh, I would I would I would mention one word that I took out of your comments that stuck with me, Aaron. Um, and you can say whether I'm right or wrong, but <clears throat> summer learning and learning in general is better done with relationships. It's like we used to say in practicing law. You know, real estate law is is not about real estate. It's about relationships. As a matter of fact, everything is about relationships. What are your thoughts about that, and what and what message would you leave with our with our audience? Well, first of all, I agree. Uh, I think most things are about relationships and the success, and this is why humans run uh, run the planet. If you read Yuval Harari's uh, you know analysis of the world, is like we are not only able to build relationships, we're able to build relationships with strangers, and that has set us apart from everyone else that's ever you know uh, walked across the planet. Uh, but I, I will say not only about relationships, just something else that's very strategic about summer learning that if anybody's listening, if you if you can find a local program that will give opportunities to kids, it's worth investing in. And the reason is it, you get a four for one deal with it. And the four for one is what I sometimes call the four eyes. I'll just tell it to you really quick. One is it's a time for improvement in the summer. It's not just for kids who improve, but the staff. And every time I wanted to train, you want to train new teachers on a curriculum, you want them to practice and learn it in the summer and practice in the program. So it's it's good for kids. All summer programs double up as staff training, what they call professional development. You know, my basketball coach used to say, nobody gets better once the season starts. And once the season starts, you're as good at basketball as you're going to be. The only one who becomes all of a sudden a star next season and gets to start instead of being on the bench is the person who put in more work over the summer. So that's just hold on to that. It's, it's really about effort over the summer that helps us grow. The second thing is about this interdependence around this idea of getting, we're so siloed across America, but in education. Schools, if you work with kids from nine to three, you do, you go over to the left. If you work with kids in the afternoon, then you go to the right, you know, from three to six. If you work with kids in the summer, you go somewhere else. We are all trying to serve the exact same kids libraries, parks and rec, schools, public housing, somebody has got to bring us all together. No one has time to work together once the school year starts, but in the summer, you could actually get all these partners to work together in a real tangible way. And if it works, then those partnerships carry on into the school year. The last two quickly is about innovation. Jay, if you have a new idea to start a summer program this coming summer, you could do it. If you want to start a school tomorrow, that would be harder. But if you want to start a summer program with Carl's help, my help, but not too much money, you get some kids, you get the right partners, you can innovate, you can create something. You want to teach kids how to work in the Coast Guard and become a tax lawyer, you could do, you know, if you could find some kids who want to do that, you could do it. And so it's the lowest bar to entry, uh, barrier to entry for being innovative. And there are tons and tons of examples. KIPP Charter School started out as a six-week summer program. Harlem RBI was a baseball after school program that now has seven schools around Manhattan. I mean, they're just example after example of national organizations, entire school systems that started out as summer programs. So it's a time of innovation. And the last thing is about impact. And Jay, you know, you strike me as someone who has a, a very good memory, and so does Carl. And I think all successful adults can look back to one summer that changed the trajectory of their lives. 
And, you know, it's at a national level, we need, you know, to invest in summer because we got to respond to COVID and we got to help kids catch up across the country. But at the most personal level, the impact is huge. And it's the difference between finishing high school and get or getting credits that send you off to college. And it's about it's the difference between having a, a, a job that pays you a minimum wage or a summer internship that leads to a career. And so this is what we get to invest in by investing in summer learning opportunities. And that's why I'm passionate about it. That's why I made it my career. And that's why Carl, who I think is trying to retire, but has seemingly no ability to do so and is writing books and keeps working and still coming to conferences for fun, because this is something that changes people's lives and has a real impact. And, and so I thank you and your audience for taking time to listen to us, but I think it's something they could actually get involved with themselves locally, with kids in their community, finding the right partners and, and, and being supportive. Oh, wow. Carl, I think you should probably thank Aaron for coming around and try to summarize the essence of what we've been talking about here. Well, you know, um, Jay, I, I, I'm very grateful for Aaron getting off a plane and going to his hotel room and getting online. That's really quite remarkable. And I've done it and I know you're like, <laughs> Try to fight going to sleep and things like this. So it's remarkable. But what he said and what is remarkable about Aaron is, um, you know, he mentioned Zion, this kid. And, you know, Jeffrey Canada of the Harlem Children's Zone has always said this, that our focus should be on children. And, um, and, 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 and you know, of course, summer programs, it's really all about this. Uh, but today I was reminded of this when I walked into Safeway in Manoa near my house and there was a Poweo student, Natasha Piafilao, who has her own business, is working in the bakery. And it made me think of another student, Precious Totten, who came from a foster family, who's now a vice principal of a school in Hawaii. And another student who, after she went in Poweo, Christy Wong, she graduated from Princeton and now is an accountant in New York. And she was one of the accountants that uncovered some things in the Washington, D.C. public schools that weren't necessarily kosher. So she did good work there. And her, her siblings followed her. And the point is um, that I put it out. And by the way, Jay, I was so complimented by um, Aaron's organization that they put my book, A Success Story in Public Education, between Thomas Friedman's book and Malcolm Gladwell's book. And I said, oh, my God, I've died and gone to heaven. And uh, that was just wonderful. But let me, let me end with um, what Aaron and you both said, which is about building relationships in this summer learning um, program. And that... In my book, A Success Story in Public Education, I said that you build partnerships, but these partnerships turn into metaphorical marriages. They become so strong that you can lean on one another for, for your help. And I think just by doing this session, Jay Fidel, you, 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 you ubermensch, um, we have become you know, sort of brothers in spirit here. And I think that's the, that's the true thing. So I, I thank not only Aaron, but you know, you're always your generosity uh, Jay, and um, I hope that this session will prove useful for the viewers, but also useful to Aaron in his future talks about what it means to uh, be the CEO of a national uh, organization that is so powerful, NSLA. I want to I want to add one thought. We're way over time here, and that is this: you talk about summer learning and uh, summer school and summer camp, and I my my youth was punctuated by that every year for all the years that I could I could think of that counted. And um, I enjoyed summer camp a lot. And it was about community. It was about relationships. And it was about perspective. You know, I had 10 months of the year in my regular thing at home in school, you know, going through the New York school system and all that. <clears throat> but for a couple of months every year, I could turn around and get some real perspective. I could see it more clearly because I had time to think about it in another environment. And that was extraordinarily valuable to me and, mm -hmm. and my brother as well, because we went through the same process. Well, thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you so All much. All right. Thanks, guys. And I'm very envious by, about your life choices to have settled in Hawaii. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be shoveling snow and you enjoy yourself. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. Thanks.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.